Good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in this evening. We're going to be doing a special comic art spotlight on the influence of George Harriman and Crazy Cat on illustrators past and present. And we've definitely got a great group of, of uh, commentators tonight uh, for this chat. And uh, I'll, I kind of want to just give you my impression because I don't really know a lot about George Harriman. I've done a little bit of research for this program, but leading up to it, uh, I really wanted to do this show because he's somebody that I, I don't, I didn't know anything about as an illustrator. And I've always really admired his work and I can see his influences in so many different creators, uh, like uh, Bill Watterson. I mean, I, I see Crumb in his work. I see so many different uh, people and I've never knew a lot about him. And the thing is, I've always admired his work. We don't have a lot of it on CAF. There's probably only about 150 pieces on our website. So you don't see it too often. And uh, the thing is, I love his layouts. I'm always, I've been so impressed by that. But one of the things that is an impediment for me in understanding the real brilliance I think of his work is I run into a problem when I when I when I try to read and understand what the uh, the meanings of some of the stories are and it's his use of language that has always confounded me when when I jump into it it's not like looking at a Calvin and Hobbes and you love the you love the art you love the layout and you can jump in and then just understand everything immediately with with Harriman's work you you have to understand the, the time it was written and the reasons for why it was written in the way it was written and 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 that to me kind of uh, is a stumbling block. And so I'm really curious about, you know, the, the, the time in which Harriman was working. And that's why, you know, we're doing the show tonight because I think it really will be illustrative to all of us to to better understand the man and the work that he was doing and, and why he was doing it at that time. So without uh, further ado, let me bring in our guests for this evening. Hello, gentlemen, uh, nice to have everybody here. Hello. I'm gonna, drop myself in the bottom here. Now, uh, before we get started, it might be good to kind of uh, at least introduce our, you know, yourselves uh, so everybody knows uh, who you are. And um, Glenn, maybe since you're kind of in the upper left, how about we start with uh, with you this evening? And we'll go- Oh, hi. Uh, I'm uh, Glenn David Gold. I'm a uh, Comic Art Fans member, uh, collector, and a writer. Michael? I'm Michael Tisseran. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am a a uh, writer and an author based out of New Orleans. Um, and among my works is a book called Crazy, uh, George Harriman, A Life in Black and White about uh, Mr. Harriman. Rob? Hi, I'm Rob Stolzer. I'm also a longtime comic art collector, about 40 years or so. I'm also a longtime teacher here in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, where I teach painting, drawing, illustration. And, uh, hi, I'm Patrick McDonald. I'm the uh, cartoonist for Mutts. And way back when, I uh, wrote a book about George Herman in uh, 1984 called uh, <laughs> Crazy Cat, The Comic Art of George Herman. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> and of course, I'm Bill Cox. I own Comic Art Fans. Uh, it's 18 years old in about two weeks. So uh, we've been trying to you know enjoy COVID as best as we can and put together these kind of chats at, since we can't go to shows or do these things in person. So thanks a lot for taking the time out this evening, everybody. Um, I, Michael, would you kind of like to kind of get us started here as far as uh, just giving us a little bit of backstory on Harriman and how he got interested in becoming an illustrator? Wow, okay. Well, you know, you actually, you actually, <laughs> <asked me. laughs> You asked me one of the questions that I was never able to answer is how I became interested in becoming a cartoonist or how I became interested in becoming an illustrator. Um, there's, I don't have a, a I mean, there's, there's a few uh, apocryphal stories about uh, being a house painter and baking or being a baker and getting fired because he baked a mouse and a loaf of bread and things like that. But um, when he was in school in California, he probably took art classes. Uh, he may be cartooned in his, uh, in his yearbook or something like that. There might have been uh, somebody that he encountered uh, when he was apprenticing at the uh, Los Angeles Herald when he was 18 and 19 um, that had a big influence. But it seemed like he was already on his path before then. Mm -hmm. And I really don't know. But Harriman himself uh, was born in 1880 here in New Orleans, uh, moving, he was about 10 years old to Southern California. Uh, he was from a, a politically active Creole of color family um, very much involved in black suffrage and black rights uh, during a time of, uh, that we all can recognize right now, a time of uh, incredible uh, violence and uh, white mob action uh, in my streets here in New Orleans uh, through his uh, early childhood. 
Um, they left that, and then uh, when he moved to Los Angeles, I, I, I can't reduce, and I, Harriman never lets me reduce uh, his work to one piece of his biography, but certainly the fact that his family passed as white, or mm -hmm. passe blanc, as French speakers they would have said, um, from that point on, and he had this uh, you know, very complicated relationship to his own identity, and this was a strategy uh, you know, that a lot of uh, people took a very divisive and painful strategy that was left to a lot of people uh, to take. Um, so that seemed to have propelled, you know, some of the meetings of identity shifts and some of the things that people identifying Crazy Cat as being uh, incredibly modern um, that he was up to, you know, already by the time he was in his 20s and 30s and the 1910s and 1920s and 1930s. Um, so uh, he created, the, um, among his great strips was Crazy Cat, and that's the reason we're all sitting here talking about him now. I, I, can, can I ask you a question, Michael? Yeah. Uh, is that, can we, can we cross-examine cross each other here, Bill? Is that right? Please do, yes. Okay. When, when you first looked at Crazy Cat, did you get it? When I first looked at Crazy yeah. Cat? Yeah, I don't know what, what it was like when you first looked at Crazy Cat. Um, when I was a child, I had uh, Jerry Robinson's book, The Comics. Um, and it's funny, I, I have a drawing I did as a kid of all the, like, of, 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 of bringing up Father and Pogo and Blondie and Dennis the Menace. And, I, and Crazy Cat's the only one I didn't draw. <laughs> but thing as a kid, it, it, didn't, it didn't grab me. Um, huh. And, uh, but, you know, later on I started to read it. Uh, Patrick's book was a revelation for me, as it was for a lot of people. Um, his writing and Karen, his, his and Karen's writing uh, is, is a lovely introduction into uh, into Harriman. Um, so, I, so I picked up that book and I was really interested in Harriman as a New Orleans. I was editing a weekly paper in New Orleans, Gambit at that time, and was interested in doing a story just on this unknown New Orleanian and, and what's the story. There was still uh, a lot of questions about his birth certificate and his, his background and his family. Uh, some people were insisting that, you know, he was uh, a son of Greeks. Um, and it was very confusing. You know, there, there wasn't really a, a, sure, um, a sure answer at that time. And it really wasn't until, personally, uh, I went to the comics, a uh, Master of American Comics exhibit uh, in, um, in Milwaukee. Uh, that's, the, that's the, I'm sure you were there probably more than once. I think, I think I missed you there, Michael. <laughs> You're there every other day. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and I was carrying my son around, uh, you know, I think the first room was the Windsor McKay room mm -hmm. and we walk into the Harriman room and I was reading Crazy Cat out loud to, to, uh, to Miles. And I really distinctly remember that one where Crazy Cat steals a picture and the thumb of conscience, consciousness, con the conscience mm -hmm. is pressing down on Crazy yes. And the Trudeau page, I believe. Yeah. 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 And, and. Miles just started, my, my kid who was four then, I think, you know, started laughing at that. And I was reading them all aloud. And that was what, for me, what locked it in, was reading, I still read Crazy Cat aloud. I, you know, um, that, that really kind of, and that, that's when I wanted to set out to try to write the biography. Well, I mean, there's such, a, there's such an incredible love of language in his work. Um, when I, when, sometimes when I read Barbara Kingsolver's work, I'll read them out loud because there's something about her form of sentences that just strikes me like it's just different from what I've read. And it, it is the same with Harriman. I mean, you think about all the dialects that he's pulling in and all the various languages that he's pulling in. Um, back, in the, back in the early 90s, I worked with Rick Marshall on those Remco volumes, those two color, those two color volumes. And Rick, um, mm -hmm. they were going to be published in different languages. And one of the questions I asked him was, how are these going to translate? I mean, how does Crazy Cat translate in Japanese or in German or in France? Because you miss all that subtlety of the, the language play. Yeah. Hey, Glenn, what was, what was, your, first, what was your first impression with Crazy Cat? Uh, I didn't get it at all, but um, huh. I, had, uh, I was about 10, and uh, I, my mom and I just moved up to San Francisco where there were incredibly sophisticated post-hippies uh, <laughs> that had great giant adult parties that uh, it was a very good idea for me to stay away from. So I would go upstairs and basically be put in a room with a stack of comics. And given that it was about 1974, those comics could be literally anything from Marvel 
to you know slow death or young lust or something like that. Um, uh, and I was given at the same time uh, Odd Bodkins and the uh, sixty-seven. What's the? It's the reissue of the uh, with the E.E. E. Cummings. Sixty-one. Um, yeah, that that without a cover on it. And I was looking at both of them, and they felt like they were opposite sides of the same coin. They were both just just outside my grasp. There was something sophisticated going on that I didn't understand, and I didn't really completely fall in love with Crazy Cat until uh, I was actually, it's um, it's the piece that's behind me now. That was uh, in a Sotheby's sale uh, in 1992, and it was on the cover of the catalog. And when I saw the cover, I immediately understood, I, it was blown up enough that, and it was, uh, and it was uh, definitely, uh, the resolution was good enough that I started to understand the amount of artistry in each line. It, they weren't just blurs. Uh, Odd Bodkins ended up being a lot of blurs um, uh, for 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 good reason, uh, and the the cat somehow I just started to understand the level of artistry that went behind it, and then I slowed down and actually started reading aloud, like you said, Michael, in the in the panels, what was going on, and it's the it's the rhythm of the voice that was in there that um, made me understand that there was there it was it's it's like poetry. And just like poetry, sometimes I understand it and sometimes I don't. But there's a sort of a, a there's like a there's a feeling to it um, that brings a lot of either melancholy or joy in a way that a lot not a lot of other uh, strips at the time did. So the art brought you to the language, Glenn. Yeah, I would have to say that's exactly what it was. Like I, I, I uh, you know how if you like pick up a Russian novel. And sort of, as they say in, in Peanuts, we sort of like blah, blah, blah over the names, over mm -hmm. the long, the patronymics and everything like that. I was kind of doing that with the language of Crazy Cat at first. I was looking at the images and then eventually I got around to actually trying to suss out what the language was. And it's the same experiences with, uh, you know, reading any sort of uh, difficult poetry. It eventually, it can resolve into something. Yeah, yeah. The, the 69 book was my introduction to, um, oh. but I was, 13, I think, at the time. And uh, boy, for me, it was love at first sight. I, oh. I, I don't think I understood it, but I knew it was the greatest thing that was ever ever done. I mean, I, I was a Peanuts fan and just loved comics. But boy, when I saw Crazy Cat, I just thought it was the greatest. Was that book like around your house or did you have find it? Well, I, have, what, I mean, being a comic fan, I was buying Peanuts books and Marvel comics. Mm -hmm. And I was probably in some store and saw Crazy Cat, knew nothing about it, but it just looked so strange. I bought it and just, you know. You had the e. Cummings book, Patrick? Yeah. yeah. Even though it had that horrible blue ink. <laughs> right. I don't yeah. know whose idea was to print it in blue, but yeah. it was yeah, cool. the, the early reprint books left a little something to be desired. Yeah. And what about you, Rob? I don't, there was no aha moment for me. I think, um, you know, I made that transition from collecting comic book art. Um, being around people who were strip collectors and collectors of old illustration and little by little, you know, seeing examples, you know, from a Jerry Muller catalog, from a Bruce Bergstrom catalog, um, early Russ Cochran catalogs, and starting to read these strips and starting to understand something about um, this this marriage of, of, of word and image uh, that was really something wonderful. So, again, I don't think there was any sort of aha, aha moment for me. Uh, but once you sink your teeth into it, I don't think there's any letting go. And the thing that's interesting about Herman to me is I don't know of anybody who has a nostalgic attachment. You know, if you're a fan of the Avengers and you read, you know, Avengers in the early 60s or mid 60s, you've got a bit of a nostalgic attachment. But I think the attachments that people have to Harriman are something more visceral than that. Hmm. Yeah. Michael, how many papers was it running in toward the end? Was It, it wasn't very many, right? You're just really good at asking me the questions I never nailed down. <laughs> I did 40 Wait, something. Wait, did you write a book on them or not? <laughs> uh, wasn't, wasn't it like about 40 or 45? You, you all, that was something that I think I actually pulled out from your information on that. About 40 by the end? Yeah, 45, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that would explain why there's not a lot of nostalgia for it. No one was, was, was really, I mean, it wasn't really widely read, was it? I think early on it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the teens and twenties, I think that was that was really the hot time. But but by the end, uh, Harriman was well aware that people weren't reading his his work. Mm -hmm. He was 
he was never disparaging or self-effacing about his art. I never saw any letter where he said, I can't draw. Right. Uh, and I saw plenty of letters where he said, no one's reading it and they can just put in old strips and no one will even know the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that, that one letter where he said, um, I think that was a, a letter you found, Patrick, but why talk to me, Al Cap? Now there's an artist, you should go talk to him instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. There's an image of Harriman and um, it, that's from Judge Magazine. Um, do we know who that person is with the Harold Lloyd glasses on there? Is he an editor from Judge, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Don't know. Boy, I never noticed it before, but looking at that, he really did heavy, he did a lot of penciling. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it looks, the things that aren't inked look like they're really well formed. Huh, interesting. I never noticed that before. We have a lot of friends who are out there um, making comments. If anybody out there knows who that person is, by the way, feel free to chime in. I think there's a few terminal uh, files there. Um, Mike uh, has commented that William Randolph Hearst was a big fan of Crazy Cat. That's another thing. I was never really able to nail down anything definitive. Uh, huh. There's a lot of myths about William Randolph Hearst telling his editors you can't cancel Crazy Cat or that type of thing. And I never found those letters. Uh, I went through Arthur Brisbane, uh, Hearst's right-hand man. I went through all of his files and letters. Um, I did find a letter from Arthur Brisbane where he's talking to another editor saying basically that Hearst likes the highbrow stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and Brisbane thinks that everything in the paper should appeal to every reader. And that wasn't important to Hearst. Hearst liked having some stuff there just for the highbrow. So I think I, I got this feeling that every time Hearst, you know, might have made noises about dropping Crazy Cat, uh, Gilbert Stell just went into another article for Esquire magazine calling it <laughs> and, and just took care of that. <laughs> so I, I don't know if Hearst loved Crazy Cat, but I think he loved the intellectual uh, prestige that having Crazy Cat in his paper brought him in the 20s and 30s at least. Hmm. Yeah, and did it's one of the other things about Crazy Cat that's uh, interesting to me, just as a on a visual level, uh, is there's definitely different eras to it. You can feel the difference in a in a, a young strip versus uh, a strip that happened toward the end. But all of them, I mean, all of the phases are great. You know, there's each even. I feel like even the uh, the era in the in the mid twenties where he was a bit hemmed in by the uh, format of things in the Sundays, sometimes those might be a little pedestrian in the way the layout works, but he often made it work for him um, in a lot of interesting ways. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of artists who you talk about that they have a peak, but for him, I mean, um, I, I I think that there's like there's a lot of peaks. It's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, I think comic strips is a, a unique art form because you're doing the same thing for, you know, 40 years, 30 years, and you could actually see how things evolve. And I, I, I know from my case, and I'm pretty sure it's probably true of all, everybody, it's not it's nothing you plan. It just happens. You know, your characters change, you change, and it's, it's not like you say, well, I'm going to make Crazy Cat look different today. It's just over the years, the way you change, the, the script changes, too. I've... I've noticed with uh, Crazy Cat Pants, all the strips, everyone gets, and I see it now in my own strip, and it's not like I'm trying to do it, but everyone gets more solid, a little chubby. Huh. <laughs> I guess it's like old age. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but but characters, characters get more solid. Hmm. Well, I think for Harriman, too, the introduction of color in 35, I guess, really changed you know, the whole appearance of the strip because the black and white strips, he re really did a lot more pen work in yeah, spaces yeah. and such. And then when color was introduced, he let the color do a lot of the talking for the space. You know, and Glenn and I have had n numerous conversations in the past about Harriman's late work. I mean, it seems like everything becomes kind of slow motion. And I I've kind of likened it to, you know, Johnny Cash's last album or some of uh, Billie Holiday's last songs where maybe the beauty of the voice is gone, but there's something, there's something just really important to say in the work, something really honest to say in the work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those are like the Johnny Cash American recordings, uh, you know, expressive in a, in a, in a new way that, that I walk the line was. Um, and things, it, get more, things get more minimal to, 
Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's almost like he's getting to the essence of what he wants to say. Mm -hmm. like he doesn't have time to mess around with extra, extra yeah. pen work, extra stuff. Um, Patrick, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the characters becoming more solid without not even your attention but necessarily, but the, since you're going over and over and over and over with them, they kind of, they, they kind of grow uh, in a way. And I'm wondering, I find the daily strips of Crazy Cat to be so much more directly linked to times in Harriman's life and sort of revealing an autobiographical. There's a lot more direct content about race uh, in the daily strips, for example. There's certainly... Uh, you know, the Sunday pages have a whole lot about identity. Uh, but there's there's something, you know, only in, you know, that only in the daily strips do you see, you know, the gag like, you know, language is so we can misunderstand each other. Mm -hmm. uh, or at the time when there's actually a, um, uh, a strip based on Crazy Cat believing that Ignatz called him the N-word, you know, like, call, you know, like, like you did. And then it turns out that it was the word enigma um, oh. that, that, that he was, you know. Oh. And that, that's really, that's, it's a, that's really direct in a way that the, the Sunday pages aren't. And, and I wonder just, huh. I, I've wondered sometimes if it's just that practice of getting the strip done, getting the, getting, getting his 30 strips done before he gets to go off to Arizona. That's, uh, that's is, is the, the, the personal material just can't, you know, can't stop it. Uh, I, think, I think that's the right answer. I think, you know, with the Sunday page, you have a little more room and a little more freedom to do some fanciful stuff. But those dailies, you just have to come up with stuff. And I guess it was things that was on his on his mind. And um, you have more because you're just filling up the space. <laughs> Your categories. Yes, I think so. The you other, the other <laughs> It wasn't my cat. No, it was just my cat, yes. <laughs> Michael, could I show that one daily that you had sent uh, I didn't have? Sure, we're talking about the dailies. Yeah. Yeah. It has this gorgeous work. Oh, yes. I go back to this one a lot. You know, he didn't sign. I mean, I've, I've looked at this strip. I think even this past year, I've probably looked at this strip, you know, almost once a day. Um, yeah. I, um, I don't really collect, but I did buy a um, an envelope that someone was selling pretty inexpensively, uh, and it was Harriman's envelope that he had sent uh, his electric bill, uh, in, and he drew the gas lamp on the outside of the uh, of the envelope. Um, and when it arrived, it arrived with this strip um, cut out of the newspaper um, and pasted onto a board uh, along with, with the envelope. So. My sense is that the person who worked at the electric company recognized who George Harriman was. Huh. I just cut the strip out uh, also. But, huh. uh, you know, uh, I, in thinking about the, the conversation we're going to have today, uh, I mentioned this in an email to you all, but, um, you know, the fact that, that Harriman came out of post, the post Reconstruction South uh, and, uh, and the Crazy Cat was born really in the midst of the Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries, 1910 Battle of the Century prize fight between the Black Champion and the White Challenger, which led to race, uh, race skirmishes and riots and deaths across the country. Um, the, the, that's one thing about, about Crazy Cat that I, not, a, not an aha moment maybe, but just continually impresses me how um, emotional and uh, multifaceted and how much lightness and darkness there is in the strip. Um, do you all ever, do the darkness in the strip or the shadows in the strip ever impress, impress themselves on y'all? Oh, yes. And, <laughs> um, yeah. I don't, I don't want to jump on too quick. I, I'm still staring at the script. This is all I'm yeah, seeing on my screen. screen. That third yeah. panel is just this uh, an incredible. Yeah. I'm thinking of Philip Gustin as I look at that. I mean, it's. Yeah, I've, uh, I've never seen. I've never seen this trip before. It's fantastic. The, yeah. One of the things that's really interesting is that that horizontal up on the top first panel going uh -huh. into the second. It looks like it was like a the title of the strip, but I've never seen that. It's so strange that that's blocked off. Yeah. Yeah, and the way the the way the object on the lower left of that first panel kind of 
vanishes. Yeah. The the the, the track. The bridge, the bridge, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I don't know what the object in the third panel is either. It looks like the edge of a baseball diamond or something like that. But uh, I thought it was a hole of some type. But yeah, it could be. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Michael, yeah. Michael, have you ever looked at that week? Was that week particularly this good, or did this, I? Boy, I'd like to find out what that week of strips was like. The first week of December, nineteen forty-three. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's. You know, we we had talked earlier that there's. Um, Pretty convincing evidence that within a month or two, um, he was getting some, uh, you know, some help on his strip from Bob Naylor, and even made a joke about a guest artist in a uh, in a January 1944 strip. Um, his health was so bad during during this period of time. Uh, that's that's probably the most overwhelming uh, thing I can say about about it. Uh, he had migraines. Uh, you know. I never want to diagnose him, but I think he was, I, you know, his grip suggests depression to me. Um, he, uh, his, his D, his granddaughter, talked about glass tubes, like draining his, his legs. Um, you know, he had, uh, you know, he was, he was just in, in, in just horrible health. Um, friends of his that traveled to Arizona talked about he had to, they, they stopped the entire trip for a week and he just went into a room. You know, by himself. You know, to, I guess to cover from migraines, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, and and by that point, by the 1943-1944, uh, he just wasn't traveling much. Why don't you show that that night? Yeah, thank you. This oh. is this is, I think the I think unless somebody knows differently, the last known photo we have of him. This is 1942, uh, when Hal Roach is going off to serve in the army, and that's oh. Elmer Bruce, uh, Hal Roach's. One of Hal Roach's sound geniuses uh, on the far left, and his, gran his grandson uh, uncovered this photo for me. Wow! Well, um, yeah. But that's Harriman. Uh, that's I think the last photo we have. And that's 1942, two, about about two years before he died. Well, he looks like out there. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't he? He's like 60, what, 62, something like that. There's right. Roughly okay. Yeah, about 62, yeah. 61. Yeah, looks yeah. very thin and very frail. Yeah. And, uh, and during this time, uh, Dee, who uh, Patrick uh, knew and loved as I did, uh, she passed away last year. Uh, she talked about visiting her grandfather. She said often, you know, it's a very darkened room, uh, you know, and it was known he had to be left alone sometimes. Hmm. Wow, that's intense. Well, you know, it's still walking out of daily strip. It's crazy. Well, and just to that daily from 1943, I mean, the pen work was fantastic. Yeah. In the last couple of years, the work did ebb and flow. You know, you can see where things sort of slowed down for him. And I guess when he was feeling better, he still had that kind of, you know, lightning in a bottle sort of approach with the, with the pen and ink. And his lightness and his generosity never left him either. Um, Bill, can you show that gift that he gave, uh, the, the wedding gift? Mm. Uh, oh, the, uh, yes. Gift? We kind of moved on to the last years of his life here, but this is also 1943. Oh, wow! And this was a uh, this was a gift to a friend uh, on the occasion of her wedding, um, and uh, you know you can see kind of the scowling, like like Patrick said, solid crazy cat there. Yeah. But, uh, but but look at the detail and fineness and, and lightness and loveliness. I I love the chunky crazy cat. I love that period. <laughs> That solidity. You ever notice that Ignat's mouse's ears, one's always white, one's always black? Hmm. I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but about 90% of the time. Hmm. Hmm. I have not noticed that. Um, I'm going to be looking at every one we show now. now <laughs> this is just gorgeous work. This is beautiful. It is. I hadn't seen this yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, done with watercolor and ink and 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 knife and blade. He did he did an awful lot of pieces for people. I mean, he did a significant number. Uh, I think when I was interviewing Gary Trudeau a couple of years ago, he he volunteered that he has done exactly zero for people. <laughs> <laughs> and and with, you know, hand coloring the originals and doing the frame. I don't know where he had the time to do that. Right now, yeah, and there's letters where he's he's really putting a lot of effort into getting the picture, getting the image from King Features, washing it up. I think he called it one time, 
Mm -hmm. um, and then he's got his um, special framer that he used in Los Angeles uh, that uh, he would bring it to and, and you know, had these wonderful mats and frames uh, put on it as well. And, mm -hmm. he, and he, yeah, he, he, it, it was very important to him to do this and mm -hmm. as well as making cards for the Seldes family. And he did a lot for Hal Roach also. He created some wonderful gifts for Hal Roach. Mm -hmm. Um, you could show the uh, the uh, hand colored daily, the one that's got the frame on it. The uh, uh, if you've got that handy, Bill. I find which one that one was. The hand colored. Oh, was that the uh, one I showed earlier? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's a, it's one. It's actually it's right behind me there. Also. Oh, that this an airplane? No, the other one, the airplane one. Uh, oh, the this is a, <laughs> um, yeah, Brian Nelson. That's the only photo I've seen. Oh, 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 I'm oh. sorry. Let me All get. Right. It, you know, give me a few minutes. I'll load that one up. I'm not sure why it's not in my set here. I, I will. The other one here, the one uh, that was on the cover of the uh, Sotheby's catalog, that was a uh, one that he did for uh, a friend of his. The uh, the the text of it is the all the gang uh, thanking a Scotty for having barked at a burglar because apparently that's what happened. There was a burglar who had broke into a neighbor's house and the Scotty scared them off. And so uh, it's uh, it's just a it's just a glorious piece of work with a lot of puns in it. Uh, it took me an awful lot of time. I, I had it I had it for about a year before I understood the finally cracked the last pun on there. Um, but uh, it's a it's a it's a joyous kind of piece of work. And uh, apparently he had framed it himself, but a previous owner of the uh, of the piece ditched the frame. Um, so hey, it happens. <laughs> collecting didn't match the couch. Do you remember what that last pun was, Glenn, that took you a year? Yes, I do. Hold on. <laughs> All right. So if I bring this up closer. Uh, so the name of the dog was, uh, was Mike. And uh, over here, there's this, what looked like a Latin scroll, sick stoves. Is that, can you see that? Mm-hmm. Uh, six toes is six toes, which is how many a Scotty has. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> yeah. The, the other experience I had in writing about Harriman is he always stayed a step ahead of me, you know, like a D and other people, uh, said he, he always had a book. Uh, you know, at his side. He was always reading. He spoke multiple li languages. And, uh, you know, there's references I know I still haven't picked up yet. Uh, this, right. is, this is your piece, right, right Glenn? Yeah, I just, uh, I just got this. And this is one that he washed up and matted and framed himself at his, at his framer. It's got the framer's uh, name on the back still. And, uh, uh, and I think you had a, you had a theory there, uh, Michael, about who it might be who Andy might be? Was this a, uh, did you? Oh yeah, we talked about that. I don't remember what it was though. Do you remember? It was a- uh... oh, Andy was a, there was, there was an Andy who was um, apparently, well, uh, the, the auction I got it from, uh, they said that the Andy uh, might have had some sort of relation to Al Cap. Mm -hmm. And I think you felt that uh, Andy might've been one of Al Cap's assistants and it might've had- some Andy Amato? Is that, say that again? A Andy Amato? Oh, okay. A name known known to people who actually know their stuff, <laughs> like myself. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I guess perhaps. Um, and then it might have been since uh, it might have been a, a thank you for help on a, on strips at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I just uh, I, again like the I just I I fell in love with the art on this uh, and the 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 absence of language in a couple of panels there. This the knowing knowing when to speak and when to shut up, which is a good lesson for, 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 for all of us. Um, and also at this point, um, everything had gotten squatter, slower, fatter, and even the brick in the last panel, uh, is now like a different shape than the bricks of uh, like 1916. Uh, and also it's like his choices of where to use the greens and where to use reds and things. It's, it's, it's not intuitive at all. It doesn't, it doesn't fit any sort of like uh, pattern of nature. But wow, it really, really works uh, both in single panels and then uh, as a whole to me. And Glenn, is this color pencil for the color? Or is this yeah, as far as like, yeah, so it's a, 
it, it seems to well actually I, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure it looks like watercolor with some what with colored pencils on top of it in places i mean his his watercolor work and patrick i think you've got one or two pieces i mean his watercolor work um, you know, he would really deviate from sort of norms in terms of color and lay complementary colors on top of each other and still keep the colors nice and clean and nice and pure. Uh, so I think it, it, it was a pretty intuitive approach to how he handled uh, coloring the strips as well as drawing them. Yeah, those watercolors are beautiful. I remember when we did the book in 84, I think we found four, maybe five hand colored things and we thought that was it. And it's just been such a thrill that every year like this one pops out of nowhere and there's another hand colored piece somewhere. I think just uh, knowing where our audience might be, this is the story might uh, be of interest. When I got a, uh, about 20 years ago when I was living in uh, Long Beach, uh, I was getting some art framed and the guy who was doing the framing, uh, he was a kid in his early 20s and I had, uh, I, uh, I had some sort of Eisner piece and he just, he knew everything about Will Eisner to know about comic art. So my, my, my grandfather was best friends with George Herman. <laughs> <laughs> like what? I said, he, I said, you know, and he, he just volunteered. Said, yeah. Yeah. My granddad's got like a, he's got like a storage unit full of stuff. I'm like, oh. <laughs> what's your number? You know, and, <laughs> uh, I'm trying not to be like the creepy grad student call, you know, it's like something out of Henry James, like the Asburn papers, just like, you know, constantly, Trying to make myself available to him, and then it was just eventually he just like stopped working at the store, and I never heard this, any further stories again. I, I have I have no idea what what happened to that storage unit. Mm -hmm. Do you got your grandfather's name? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was it was Andy something. It was Andy. <laughs> did, he, did he say what the grandfather's connection was? Was he a cartoonist? Uh, he did not. Say, he did not say at the time. Mm. It's, uh, and also, this was early on enough in my in my collecting career where I didn't understand like things like that, that were not going to drop in my lap every fifteen minutes. That yeah. this was something <laughs> extraordinary, you know. Uh, well, if that's Beanie Walker's grandson you met there, I may never forgive you for getting <laughs> that connection. Tell me, tell me <laughs> well, you're so good with that, Bill. <laughs> I am. <laughs> There's Beanie Walker. Yeah. That's cool. Cool. Yeah, Beanie Walker was Harriman's. Uh, that's that's who um, uh, the Dirks has uh, told uh, Harriman's obituary writer for Time Magazine, uh, who Harriman's closest friend was, was Beanie Walker. Oh wow! He knew him from the newspaper days, uh, but then uh, Beanie was then uh, when Beanie went on to the Hal Road Studios, uh, they were good friends uh, there, and mm. uh, you can you can just see you can see the. Yeah that photo it's 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 I, I love this picture and how long did harriman maintain a presence at the how road studios um he started in the early 20s and you know another thing I've, i was never able to find was um uh there there are a number of articles that talk about there there were little hollywood columns about harriman being at the how road studios and a couple of them say that he would jump in and stand in as an extra so I continue to watch, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a regular watcher of this thing Ben Modell does uh, every Sunday, the silent comedy watch party uh, mm -hmm. on YouTube, and he includes a lot of Hal Roach comedies. And all I do is look at the crowd scenes whenever I'm seeing those things, <laughs> looking for Mr. Harriman. But um, he was there through the 20s, and I get the feeling that um, by, uh, by the 30s, he was pretty much, uh, pretty much checked out. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, by the by, the mid thirties, hmm. uh, um, and was was moved into his house uh, up in up, up in the Hollywood Hills. Because we think that some of those studio portraits, though, were were shot at the Hal Roach Studios. Yes, those larger photographic yeah. portraits. Right, those are mid thirties, I believe. I think, okay. I think I figured out a date for that. I think it was maybe 35, 36. So that seemed to be, I think, on the on the tail end. Um, but that that picture with Hal Roach shows that that his connections to those folks stayed through nineteen forty two. Uh, you know, next day through the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, my, my theory is just always that his his experience of doing the strip in the Hearst Art Room with Tad Dorgan and everybody else, uh, you know, engaged in all kinds of hijinks all around him, that he just missed that so much. And the Hal Road Studios was where he could replicate that and and mm. you know be sitting on a strip with all this all this fun 
you know, it was a lot of fun, uh, was the name of the, you know, the nickname of the road studio. There's all this fun going on around him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of those days. You know, it's such a lonely, singular profession. It must have been so much fun to be in a room. I don't know how you got any work done, but it must have been so fun <laughs> to be in a room with all those cartoonists trying to top each other. I could tell you a funny story about this strip. Maybe not funny. <laughs> so we were working on the Crazy Cat book, and we were interviewing uh, Carl Eubenthal, who was a great sports cartoonist for the Hertz papers. Yep when there used to be sports cartoonists. And um, he said a, a friend of his had uh, some crazy cat originals and will uh, let, let him know that I'm doing this book. And I think a month passed and then our next, I lived in Hoboken at the time and our neighbor said, oh, we have a package for you. It's been in our, uh, in our hallway for a month. <laughs> And it was just real flimsy cardboard. And when I opened up the cardboard, this was one of the pieces. Wow. Wow. Well, well, that's an incredible story. <laughs> and I, know, I know the color in this piece, especially in those that second tier. I mean, the color is just incredible with the violets and the oranges. Just beautiful. Yeah, it's one, it's one of my all-time favorites. The layout on that is amazing. Yep. I just, I just think if I had the, you know, if, if, if the Louvre was on fire and this and the Mona Lisa were side by side, <laughs> this is the one I'd grab. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's just, it beautiful. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Well, plus uh, this one, you might actually be able to take off the wall, the Mona Lisa <laughs> bolted to the wall. So it's a good choice. Uh, so do, do any of you guys have an actual, favorite period i know it's like picking a favorite child but is there is there a particular period that does it for you more than another one um it, by the way this is this was a gift to pinky springer before it was a gift to patrick mcdonald huh? oh <laughs> looking at a harriman signature there to old Jack springer pinky, pinky. i'm guessing is that pinky springer that was the illustrator that was a good friend of a uh, good friend of harriman's yeah that i'm sure that's what it was yeah it was um i think well, if I remember right, it was maybe his grandson or his, it was someone related to P.C. Springer that that, mm. that mm. Um, Yeah, the answer, my, my answer is no, I don't have a favorite at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. I do, by the way, I just want to take a minute to tell everybody who's watching they should buy Michael's book. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to read it fairly early and I reviewed it for the Washington Post and I loved it. It's, uh, it's got a lot of things to recommend for it. And I imagine if you're watching this, you're into comic art anyway. Uh, yes. This really, it, it, it establishes why Harriman is not just important, but also when you get to the end of it, you just, you just kind of can't get enough of his work. And I especially, uh, Michael already referred to it, but I was especially just blown away by uh, the description of the prize fight, the uh, the Jack Johnson uh, prize fight in the middle, because it's so uh, it's it's such a vivid description, and then also I had no idea that that was the way that the strip what it had risen from, and it really roots it just in the importance of uh, of race in the United States, which of course is something we're talking about a lot, but then also all the artistry that spills out of that on the other side is just it's it's remarkable, and uh, anyway, just big thumbs up for it. You should get it. Yeah, let me let me add to that. It's an amazing book. I, when we did our book. If we found one new sentence of facts about George Herman, we would jump up and down. And, <laughs> and, my God, this book is, is amazing. You really get a feel for who he was and, and the times he lived. It's just absolutely. Yeah. I had a um, an advantage you didn't, Patrick, uh, which is the blessing and the curse of the internet. Mm. Yeah, uh, that, that was a big. You know, I mean, I, I spent time just, you know searching, you know, George Harriman's name with any sort of random word I could attach to to see what fact might pop up. Um, but then also, uh, living in New Orleans was a bit of a help too because I was able to find the uh, Catholic Archdiocese had more information about his family than I could find through any other schools. Because when somebody went in for a wedding or for a, uh, a baptism, all the parents and grandparents were listed. So I was able to actually put his genealogy together through that. So. I will say, and, and then one, you know, the, one of the my first stop when I when I set up to do the book, my first call was to D, uh, to the Harriman's granddaughter, mm -hmm. uh, and I had I did not know her at all. Um, I didn't know how she would feel. I didn't know what what her information 
what her feeling was about I didn't know if she was going to be a political conservative who did not want to talk about race uh, in her family or anything like that, which is turned out to be completely the opposite uh, case. Uh, I wasn't, you know, and I said, you know, I'm wondering if I could talk about your your grandfather, and and, and she said, my favorite subject. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Yeah, she was great. Uh, lost a, friend, uh, a friendship, and Patrick, I know uh, you had similar feelings about her. A delightful, warm, intelligent uh, person you can tell was Karen's grandfather granddaughter. And then my second stop was to Patrick and Karen's. And you opened up your box of, of you know, many primary source documents and letters. And um, I don't, I, maybe I shouldn't say this because other scholars will come expecting the same treatment, but we spent uh, two hours or so in a New Jersey Kinko's making copies of all of your, uh, of all of your archives, uh, which were invaluable. Um, and but it was that way across the board. There were other, a lot of other people that very generously shared this letter they had, or, or this, you know, I mean, every one of those collected pieces uh, talks about, you know, it has, has something to say about Herman's friendship. Uh, you know, Herman's friendship with Pinky Springer, um, you know, can be deduced from that. From that so these, these, this, this art that he created uh, for his friends uh, pointed the way toward the story of his life. It, it's funny right now. Um, I'm uh, the next book I'm reviewing for the uh, post is the Stan Lee biography, um, and what's interesting is that unlike uh, Harriman, of course, there's there's nothing but Stan Lee material everywhere. Um, but there, the the one thing that uh, I, I found that it must must have been frustrating for you as a, as a biographer is I don't think that there's a ton of places where Harriman really put down his intent. I mean, there's there's a few places. But for the most part, his letters are more chatty. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of like statement of purpose, unless I'm mis unless I'm mis misremembering. And it seems like he had to go to the work, and then also kind of the choices made in life to really find out what what drove him. Is is that is that an accurate thing to say? Yeah, and I, I you know, I, I think when you're a biographer, um, you can choose how much of your own interpretation you want to bring into the narrative. And uh, and I I sort of chose to put in not much really, you know, I really, really did not want to say Harriman was thinking about this when he did this. Um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to put Harriman on the couch, you know, on the, on the, and I didn't want to, um, you know, make conclusions that I felt, uh, you know, 10 years later, I'll look back and think I had more to do with me than, you know, with, than with Harriman. Mm. So I really tried to stick close to, to the documents I had, which meant there's some big gaps in the work. Um, there is very little about his marriage, for example, because there are no documents. There are no letters between him and his wife that exist. Um, there's only really only one moment uh, when he's writing to his friends in Arizona, and he said um, he, he's, he's sending money and he wants to have, have throw a party for his daughter and his daughter's uh, a husband, an anniversary party for them in Arizona. And this was after his wife died. His wife's nickname was Kitty. and. Uh, and he said, this was Kitty's idea. She talks to me sometimes. Mm. Uh, no. that, that's, the, that, that's the single moment in any of his work that spoke of his love for his wife. Um, mm. You know, there were family stories uh, that that marriage was possibly uh, on the rocks. Um, but, you know, even, even Dee got her stories about her mother from her mother's friend, who you met, Patrick, but I never even met her. So... So even even these stories were coming filtered by somebody that I didn't know and didn't know what what uh, was it her name Beeb I think yeah uh, Beeb I went to her ranch in Arizona mm. um, wow she was she was amazing the ranch half of her ranch was given back to Mexico when when I mean that's how uh, old it was and her house was if you ever saw it, there's a Steve McQueen western I think it's called Tom Horn mm. and huh. that, the house in that in that uh, movie was Beeb's house in Arizona. Yeah, amazing. Wow. But, you know, that was the shame. I mean, we did that book back in '84, but even in '84, most of the people that really knew him were gone. You know, like we had to talk to, you know, his daughter's friend. You know, as someone who actually kind of knew him. You know. Yeah, yeah I, I was I I was able to find about I think eight people that knew him that spent mm -hmm. time. With him, and this was, you know, in the last in the last ten years, um, but they were all children. 
You yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, no, no contemporaries. It was all people that knew him at a young age. Um, and he would, he would mention in letters to Louise Harriman how much he, Louise uh, Swinnerton rather, how much yeah. he did writing. So I, I don't think it's an accident that there's not that much that exists, you know, mm -hmm. that describes his life. Besides, you know, I think one of the things from the more recent books that have come out, Michael and, and Patrick's, there were always rumors about Harriman, you know, when I was collecting early on, and there was a lot of misinformation about Harriman, and that misinformation always seemed to be perpetuated. And I think that's one of the things with your books that really helped to put more flesh under the bones that sort of goes beyond the, the misinformation that a lot of us thought was correct as we were growing up with this stuff. It was based on things that Harriman said. Right. So, you know, it, had, it had an honest source, uh, for sure, and there wasn't, you know, there weren't, you know, other documents weren't brought up to, to flesh out the story. You know, one of my biggest surprises was finding, I knew that his family was from New Orleans. I knew they were, they were black. Um, I had no idea that they were ferociously politically active. I mean, they were, they were political activists uh, deeply involved in voting rights and, and uh, you know, uh, bringing about, uh, you know, I mean, in a mystical way, they were part of a, a seance movement. Uh, and, and in a very political way, they, had, they signed onto a petition that was hand delivered by family friends to Abraham Lincoln for voting rights. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they were involved in a Masonic, uh, an integrated Masonic lodge. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, and, and the people surrounding them, uh, the first black owned daily newspaper in the country of the New Orleans Tribune was, was run by friends of, friends of the Harrimans. And you could get tickets to political rallies at the Harriman tailor shop on Royal Street, you know, from, you know, there were ads for that in the newspaper. So it was just this incredible community. Um, and, and so when I say I don't know, there's things I, I tried, I tried in the book to present that information. And, and to make it clear that that's what the Harrimans left behind, you know, when they went to Los Angeles and passed his wife. And, and any isolation that Harriman felt, any notes of melancholy and loneliness uh, you feel in his later work, especially, or really throughout, throughout his work, um, that disassociated feeling you get, I think, from Crazy Cat. Um, I'm not gonna say that it's connected, but I don't see how it's not connected uh, mm. to, that, to that family history. Uh, I know that he was, some things he, some things he wrote about, he didn't really write about his work uh, closely. He, he wrote about his love for his father uh, very clearly uh, in his letters. He wrote about his love for his daughter, Bobby, um, many times. I think that was maybe his deepest, deepest love, I think. And, you know, she was an artist and illustrator as well and seemed to love everything he loved. She developed her own friendships with their Arizona friends. Um, and the desert. <laughs> he wrote very clearly about his love for, for the desert in the Arizona and Utah desert and where his ashes were stored. <laughs> the early stuff. <laughs> well, you were asking before, and I love all the different years of Herman, but I, I really do love the early stuff. Yeah. This one in particular with their two souls switching bodies. Yeah. And I love Mock Duck as a character and that little head popping out of that circle. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny how endearing some of the secondary characters can become. Uh, Bumblebee is one of my favorite characters. Yeah, oh my God, Bumblebee. And, and the, the little descriptions that Harriman would use to introduce Bumblebee into a narrative, you know, a paragraph related to his entrance into it. They're just wonderful, as, as well as Joe Stork. There's something about those two characters that um, they're, he brought them to life in a different sort of way than the other characters. And I tell you, the, the other magic with Herman, like when you look at that group of people there, Officer Pup and this Joe Stork, and the, mm -hmm. I mean, they're like cute and cartoony and yet not cute and cartoony at the same time. I don't know how he did that, but <laughs> like, like part of me sees them as like really cute and that's why I love them, but then, and throughout the years they change, but they were always like cute, but also there's something else about them that's not cute, which is uh, pretty hard to do. And how many times did cartoonists of that generation use pictures on the wall with some big nail to hang them like, like this one? <laughs> Usually because it's a lot. I think I'm the only cartoonist that still does that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Love those big dells. <laughs> right, and he put them on stage too. There'd be a curtain that would draw, or be very clear, you know, clear that he was staging uh, this this little pageantry. I also from the from the composition and from the postures of these characters, it does remind me um, of some underground cartoonists as well. Um, I mean, you can see the influence. I mean, besides just like the obvious, like Bobby London, there's just, um, uh, you can just sort of see the same kind of energy going into um, some of the like earlier Zap pages and things. Well, we were talking earlier about the difference between the dailies and the Sundays. In this Sunday page, I mean, it's a, it's a grid, you know, like he was doing in the late 20s and early 30s, but the way he used, uses the openness of the space, you know, a horizon line just sort of dissipates and so he, he uses emptiness so beautifully, it becomes uh, really fulsome in the way he handled it. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of imagine being the artist and like, <laughs> here's panel one, and then just looking at the rest of the page when you're, you know, just the, the, the blank page on there is, it could be is so intimidating to approach, I guess, as, as far as realizing what the composition is going to be on the whole thing. And this, the, the patience it takes just to do that, lay that out panel by panel, it's kind of amazing. I, I kind of wonder if whether he had had the idea at the beginning what the whole thing was going to look like, whether he had that balance in mind, or whether it was a discovery for him as he went through. Or it was just intuitive as he was doing. Yeah. yeah. He, he tended to sort of, he would occasionally like counterbalance corners with blacks, you know, so sometimes you'll see like, in, or in this Sunday with the two black and white panels, uh, those higher contrast panels, he, he often did that from the corners, but I, I, I agree with Patrick. I think there's just an intuitive nature. Like he knew at times he knew when enough was enough. He might as well stop uh, before you say too much in the piece. What's yeah. nice about this one too, you really can't see it, but in that panel where Ignatz throws the, uh, actually, I don't think it's a brick here. I think it's a piece of stone, but uh, little, the little onomatopoeia he uses is jazz. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is 1917, I think. Wow. wow. Yeah, real early on. And uh, he, oh, his family was connected uh, to Jelly Roll Morton's family in New Orleans as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I give him credit. You know, I think he came up with uh, the hip because Crazy Cat always said he was a hip cat. And then jazz yep. people used to start saying they were hip and hip cats. I, I think Herman came up with that. Huh. No, can you imagine the conversations he and Tad Dorgan would have had? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I think you know the the, the the jazz ballet was the first uh, use of that word. Although the music, did, uh, you know, maybe maybe wasn't the the hippest music possible, mm -hmm. uh, but, but staging a jazz ballet uh, in New York in 1922, I think it was, um, certainly put you know Crazy Cat into the jazz world. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if there's anything I, I could, uh, I wish I could go back and, and, and grab from the past, it's the setting that Harriman created for that ballet, which was on two, two rollers. He created the, the, the scenery and they rolled it to, to kind of recreate that, uh, that shifting scenery of Coconino County uh, right. on the stage. Hmm. Um, uh, could you go back to that? I just want to read that one line again, uh, on that last strip. Sleep releases the incorp incorporeal, incorporeal self. I want to say corporal, but it's the incorporeal self. And as we can easily see, two immaterial forms pass quietly out into the night. Um, you know, Harriman's spirituality um, is another uh, sort of open question in a lot of ways. He was raised Catholic. Uh, his parents remained Catholic and were buried in a Catholic, you know, you can see their graves in a Catholic cemetery in Los Angeles. Uh, but Harriman seemed to, you know, the the, the spiritualism of uh, of the seance movement that his father and grandfather were part of mixes with Catholicism, mixes with Navajo or Diné beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, beauty prayer, the Navajo beauty prayer in his strips frequently, uh, mixes with theosophy and, and reincarnationism, um, which gets a lot of references in his strips too. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to imagine what kind of belief system uh, mm -hmm you know, he, he had. All in the local funnies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I recognize mm. that one. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, when I I can tell you that uh, you know, it's coming coming at this from somebody who really doesn't know a lot about the history of strip art um, and looking at Harem and Sundays. Yeah, the thing that impressed me was they seem so thrown together without any thought, and yet they're so you know they're so perfect. And and that was the that's the thing that really impresses me about looking at the Sundays. I, I almost don't want to read it. I just want to look at the imagery and the and, and the way he structured the page because it. it it's. I, I first look at it and I think there could be no plan behind what he was doing, and yet, it. it you know, there's. It's. It's so beautiful, and, and like I, it's so weighted on, in this particular example with the blacks on on the right hand side. I mean, visually, I, I, my first blush would be that it's not. It doesn't look very symmetrical. It's not the way I would have, would have laid it out. And then, but I, I can look at the closer scan and looking at it, it just looks. It's just amazing. The, you know, the, the, what, he, what he's done to this. It's. I mean, this is hanging up right in front of me right now over my desk it's you know it's basically a grid but it doesn't look like it has a grid structure to it really and the thing about works like this um to me it's just not an overthought piece it's like he was thinking and doing at the same time and just again having that intuitive sense of when enough is enough or or when to interject some odd imagery or odd symbolism you could see in the the bottom section on the right hand side the second tier from the bottom, you know, the little figure of woe, you know, that's descended into that space. I mean, such a wonderful invention. And you know, I think the word's playful. I mean, yeah. It's like a it's like a saxophone player doing his solo. It's just uh he's playing with it. Yeah. You know, another thing I don't know is what music he was listening to. Um he certainly makes reference to some, to some songs uh, throughout. He liked popular music and he liked jazz. But in that uh, drawing that I, I learned about because of you, Patrick, that he created for Louise uh, Cher Swinnerton, showing the interior of his house, uh, you know, he shows a phonograph playing music uh, there. So I, I imagine he was listening, listening while he was working. Yeah, I, I would have loved to see his record collection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lola Roach, uh, who was one of the, uh, was Jack Roach's daughter and traveled with Harriman to Arizona on one trip, uh, said they sang the song Ragtime Cowboy Joe, uh, on, and that was the song they would sing as they were driving along. Uh, I'm going to spend an all the time trying to figure out what Zwaz Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you've probably spent some time looking at that. Uh, come up with anything? I, indeed. I, I will sit back and read particular panels every so often of this piece because it's uh, it's got the playfulness that Patrick talked about. It's got melancholy. Um, um, world, right? Yeah, I mean, this little invention of the electric eel for, for light. Um, just, you know, the whole thing is, for me, it's perfection. It's that kind of perfect marriage of image and text. And look at Woe's shoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woe comes in with big feet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay, woe, dire and dour. That's gorgeous. Despondency spreads its somber wings over the house of Ignatz Mouse. And and you know it's interesting uh, as as one of the things that Patrick and I talk about occasionally is the like the the spectrum between Herm and, and Kirby uh, in the sense that Kirby is all surface in, in a way and all text and Herman's a lot of poetry on the sides. However, they both use quotation marks really weirdly. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So is that uh, despondency that uh, that creature there with the long black wings? That's a that's a that's despondency. It absolutely mm. is. <laughs> and then you get you know that little the back of the chair that Ignatz is sitting on. You get that little Navajo sort of pattern that he would slip in every so often. Mm. Constantly. Yeah, constantly more than every so often. <laughs> right. You know, I sort of as we look at some of these examples, I kind of wonder how the strip played in more melting pot parts of the country versus parts of the pun parts of the country that were more homogenous um, because the language use, I mean, you think about when he lived in New York, 
and was picking up, you know, Yiddish and picking up Italian, picking up Spanish and German, how much that, how much that comes into the, to his language use in the strip. And I'm sure in California as well. Um, well, Stan Lee told me that, that, uh, through email, uh, that the language was what, was what he loved, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, when he first, when he first read it. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Seuss also was a childhood fan of Crazy Cat. It's one of one of the few people that I found who who talked about loving Crazy Cat as a child. Um, how do you how do your, your students in Wisconsin, uh, Rob? Do they uh, do they rebel against Crazy Cat and the the the, the, the work? No, not, not at all. I mean, they're really they're really open to seeing examples of that sort of work. The thing I find with Harriman is he doesn't project well on screen. I mean, he's one, he's one of the people that, you know, if I'm handing out work as hard copy, handing out, you know, copies of his work, it tends to read better that way. Um, it's just hard to really get the cadence of the work and even just to read it when you blow it up to, you know, to a projection. That's interesting. Hmm. We should look at some more images. There we go. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So this is that period where he really started playing with the logo a lot more as well. And this would have appeared in color, right? It's 37? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah, so you could really see how much more open the spaces are. And this is another example where, you know, it's night, it's day, and then it's night at the end. So he's sort of playing around with, you know, with contrast on the top and bottom. And again, the minimalist of this in his later work. I mean, just nice little person who. Yeah. The color the King features uh, added to the strip is, is such a different palette than the color that uh, uh, that Harriman chose when he when he would you know colorize the the, uh, the strips for for friends. And uh, I yeah, there you go. And. Patrick, did you ever find out if, if Harriman had a say in, in the fact that the elephant uh, he would be yellow and the desert would be pink here, for example, and the mace would be orange? And the... Jeez, I don't remember. I, I always took it for granted he did color his own Sundays. Mm -hmm. Oh, dude, matter of fact, um, recently I think Heritage had one of his um, color guides. Oh, did they really? Really? It was from Harriman? This is, this is news I'm, to me. I'm guessing it was from Harriman. I have not seen that. I mean, his his colors, the the printed colors, are so relatively garish compared to the watercolor work he would do in the yeah. specialty pieces, like on on the daily strip that that we saw of Glenn's. Um, I mean, just these these really loud blocks of color. They're gorgeous. Uh, they're they're almost like you know starting to get into you know fifties painting in a way, almost like color field painting if you mm -hmm. uh, remove some of the figures, but very different from the coloring he did as gifts for people. Well, you really can't capture that watercolor look on. So I think he just went with a whole different look with these things, but they're so unique. I mean, no one colors like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting. I remember there maybe, well, 20 or 30 years ago now, it's all kind of a blur. There was a hand colored Sunday page that showed up at auction somewhere and it was determined that it was not colored by Harriman, but the colors were more like this. You know, so somebody yeah. must have gotten a hold of a black and white one and looked at a tear sheet and said, okay, that's the way he would have colored it. <laughs> and kids, if you're thinking of collecting at home, make sure you ask an expert before buying a hand-colored Harriman because that, yes. that happens sometimes. <laughs> uh, there, there's a, there's a hand-colored Sunday out there that we printed from the original in black and white because it was in black and white. Now. Oh, and now it's in color? Oh, wow. Yeah, yes. I remember that, yes. <laughs> and they actually did a really good job. I mean, you you would think it looks like Herman could have done it, mm. but I guarantee he didn't, <laughs> not, not after it before. Oh. Yeah, the, the pink is such an inter interesting color for him to introduce in, in these tear sheets because it's um, pretty minimal mm -hmm. compared to some of the other colors. I wish to draw attention to Ignatz's ears. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, you're like, Glenn, you're making me realize that when I drew, I have a character named Sourpuss, and one of his ears is white, and one of his ears is black, and I think it's just like a depth thing. <laughs> right. It might, it might have some secret, you know, uh, 
connection to it, but it might also just be you try to show one in the front and one in the yeah. back. But both of Ignatz's legs are in shadow. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have to say, both Ignatz and Crazy's legs were the first thing I noticed about the art back even when I was like 10 and 12. It's because they shouldn't work. I mean, as like I don't even mean like mean as, as as far as like uh, you know anatomically, I just mean like recognizing them as legs. It takes an, it's an extra sort of effort to do it, but they they're they're perfect. There's something about them that adds a certain level of like chaos and energy to the to the to it. That even if they're just standing there, they seem to be moving. This one's really nice. Oh, we lost it. Oh, sorry, I'll pull it back up. Yeah. But um, another thing I love with Herman is his clouds and smoke. Yeah. Yeah, look at that strip. All the little clouds and all the little little smoke things are always really interesting. Yeah, he was doing that even when he was the cartoonist in New York, age 21, 22. He would do this really distinctive uh, sort of donut shaped clouds. Uh, and at one point, it rings around a mountaintop. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, kind of like you know playing a game with his clouds uh, on the mountain. That was that was early on uh, before Crazy Cloud. You know, ten years before Crazy Cloud. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the the full Sunday page, that last large panel, I think those are those elephant feet that he would sometimes put into the into the landscape. Mm -hmm. He knew that landscape well. Yep, well, we've seen those elephant feet before. Yeah, it's a great, a great time, a great, a really fun place to visit. And that's uh, as opposed to um, you know the mittens where you're going on to Navajo land. Uh, when you see the elephant feet, you just kind of drive up, and they're right on the side of the road there. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would recommend anyone who's a crazy cat fan, if you haven't gone to Monument Valley, go. Mm -hmm. I think it blew. I mean, you know, as a kid reading that, you know, you just took it for granted. He was making all that stuff up, but uh, to actually go and see all those things, it's like going, that's where his, that's where his ashes are. So you're kind of visiting Araman yeah. too. Yeah, it's like going to the Crazy Cat Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> what are, What are we looking at here? This is a piece on comic art fans, actually. I, I pulled, pulled up a couple examples that were unlike what we had uh, selected. So um, this was a color piece. And I just I, I just looked at it because it reminded you, you were mentioning the clouds and how it drew smoke. Right. And, and I thought uh, this was an interesting piece. Would, would this be around 1918 or so, 1919? Uh, uh, here's this is to uh, Edith Ryan. Say hello, lady. We're <laughs> here to interview you. Uh, it does not have a date on it. Um, Style-wise, it looks to be late teens or so. Yeah, it does not have a does not have a date written in the description for the piece either. Yeah, and I don't know Edith Ryan. I don't, I don't know. So, Harriman Her seems to have been good friends with Gus Dirks's or, or Rudolph Dirks, well, Dirks's sister or wife, because I've seen oh. a few. Yeah, pieces. Yeah. Right. yeah, he's very close to, to Rudy and Helen. Uh, that's his wife, right? Right. Okay. Mm. Huh. Wow. That's that's cool. it. it was uh, 1933 on this yep. piece. And it was to, uh, it looks like B.M. Meeks of the University of Georgia. Hmm. He loved his violets. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> I, I like how he spells Georgia. That's good. I mean, differently. I mean, See, I, you know, get that. I, I, I probably would have had to have said it out loud and I might have gotten. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, but that's the thing. You have to say it out loud. Do. I, uh, do. There's there's uh, there, well, I, I also had passed on to you a Sunday that's in, um, it's a black and white one. That's it's all completely unintelligible stuff that ends up that ends up being all uh, Greek mythology. But uh, mm -hmm. we'll get to that eventually. Do you think his uh, framer tried to hide when he saw Harriman come in? <laughs> Having to cut these mats, not more circles, not more odd shapes. Well, Harriman gave him a gift. There is there's a piece of work that that Harriman, uh, a piece of art that Harriman created for his framer. Mm. They were friends. So I'm just going through. Uh... I think I've got it still on my my USB drive, but I'm gonna have to pull that off. Sorry about that. I... Um, I'm looking at the comments here, and Andrea talks about her father used to say, what a whirl, what a whirl. It'd be nice to grow up. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and yeah, a piece of work we haven't talked about, uh, David McPherson uh, talked about the illustrations for Don Marquez, which I learned uh, from a Don Marquez scholar. Uh, is it, pronounced that way, Don Marquez. It's uh, not Marquis, huh? All right. Okay. Uh, which are which are wonderful, and the, and those were missing for the longest time, and they showed up uh, on 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 online auctions as yeah. one big mass of uh, originals now, and they they are wonderful. Do you know what the story behind that was? Where where they were? I've I've asked, and I have not been answered. I I, I don't know the I don't know. Well, I know part of the discussion is about influences of Harriman and somebody I don't hear talked about very much. I think, Patrick, you might have known him, Bob Laughlin, Kids yeah. and Cats. Yeah. yeah, I mean, clearly influenced by Harriman. And one of the early collectors, my God, he had a great collection of uh, original crazy cats. Before, when they were affordable. <laughs> sort of. Right. The first crazy cat I bought was the most money I ever spent on anything. Yeah. Actually, the first San Diego show I went to in 1992, when I walked in, there was a dealer who was, he said, <laughs> I walked up to his table looking for Kirby art. And he instead, he like put this, he put a crazy cat in front of me, a, a daily. And he's like, look, do you know anything about this? I said, no. He said, because I need to sell this right away. And I didn't, I had no idea what I was looking for. It was a daily from the thirties with a brick throwing in it that uh, he was like going to unload for a song. But I just, I, again, I, uh, there's a lot of things I stumble over that I never follow through with, but it's not, it's not a, it's, it's not a strip that you see a ton of times, like at, at dealers places, people who, who, um, who have them tend to love them and um, they, they, they don't move that often. Hey Glenn, was that image the one that was the framed image? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll pull. It. it was a little blurry, which is why I, when I was formatting the images, I, I didn't think it was going to transfer well to the it screen. Might not so go well. I'm sorry about that. Oh no. It's no. I I could tell it was incredible. I just couldn't make a, make out a lot of detail. But let me. Uh, I'm just going to format it. I'll get it in the screen here if you give me a second. Okay. Right. I might have sent you like a smaller scan of it or not. That might. Be, yeah. But I'll I'll pull it up. Yeah. You know. Um. Yeah, actually, the, the master show was uh, was a big deal for me too, Michael. That was uh, that was the first time I'd seen a lot of Harriman art in one place as well, and seeing it on the walls of a museum, and then also just having some sort of uh, context for it was uh, was important to understanding it. You saw it in California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was uh, and uh, they had they had it in the two separate museums with the strip art in one museum and the uh, comic book art in a different museum. Yeah, I was. That was about a year after Katrina that I saw it, and so we had mm -hmm. moved from New Orleans up to the Oh, that's not it. That's not the one I meant. That's not the one you meant. All right, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, there's another one. It's also framed. Uh, it's. Uh, I don't even know. How, it's. It's rather hard to describe. Uh, except it's 1936. I think. Might 1936. Be. Okay. Yeah, I've got that one on the side here as well. Let me. I'll, I'll fix that one. Okay. But it had a real emotional impact. Yeah, I think that that Harriman room. There's when you saw all that work. Uh, together like that. Rob, I mean, did you, you, you must've gone there every day, right? Well, it, it's a little far to go every day. It's only three and a half <laughs> hours or so, but that, <laughs> that show was a lot to take in. I mean, besides Harriman, the Chris Ware work, the, the Kurtzman work was incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, to be able to see the work up close, I mean, it, it's great to be able to see so much work online, but there's nothing like seeing the pen work and the, the, the razor scratches, you know, up close and personal. Now, when you guys are saying razor scratches, is that kind of like the Ramita kind of razor scratches where you fill in an area with blacks and then scratch in to make yeah, This is the, the pre-Ramita razor scratch. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but I was just want to make sure when, when you've mentioned it a few yeah. times. I've not been able to you're surfing in Ramita's wake is what we're telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that Sunday page you showed earlier that takes place partly underwater, there are sections in there where he, he would scratch through to give a sense of, of, of showing that the scene takes place underwater. And especially in the later work, he scratched through the, the, the originals quite regularly. Yeah, some of that later work is half of it scratch. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a beauty. Mm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's, this, this was in the uh, uh, Masters show. Uh, mm -hmm. as well. And 
uh, is 36. And I, I uh, one of the, oh, the other thing I noticed about seeing a bunch of harem on Sundays, one after the other together, is that it felt like almost every one of them was a different size. I mean, I know that's not quite true. I, I know there was different standards, but he definitely, they, they definitely took different shapes. Glenn, that, that always boggles my mind. I mean, the whole thing with comic strips is you do everything the same size for newspapers, but I think every crazy cat I have is a different size. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, this looks like he had some early sports cartoons that were based on dreams like this. He had a boxer uh, that that dreamed that he was a great Roman fighter. And mm. often he would bring in Greek and Roman mythology into his dreams, uh, as he does uh, in, in this one. Um, he, he did that a lot. Some really interesting depictions of dreams in 1903, 1904. Huh. This, this sort of harkens back to that. I, that language use, noble, marvelous, colossus. <laughs> yeah. Cavi Canum. Yeah. Hoysel defending his bridges. Yeah. Witty, these... witty, weaky. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And do we have it? Was 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 Joyce a fan, or do we not know? Um, I don't have it. No, I don't. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Unfortunately. Because it just seems like the type of thing that would uh, would tickle him. But, uh, it's uh, there's just something about it also that just feels so spontaneous here, even though I know that it, it couldn't be. Um, but there's just the the energy and the motion in it. I uh, I absolutely love. Glenn, why do you say you don't think it could be spontaneous? Do you do you think that there is a chance he was doing some free association riffing as he was? Oh, I mean, it? I I you know I don't I it's hard to. You know, I can't really put myself in the in the in the in the writer's room exactly, but it feels like there's a point. I mean, you might you must feel this, all of you guys. There's a point when you're doing work and you kind of vanish into it a little bit, right? And you start to. It's like the whatever it is that's happening is happening a little bit outside of you, and you're trying to keep up. It might not start out that way, but I think that at one point, if you've got one good sort of <laughs> Greek mythology reference that you've managed to, to tackle that uh, that as you're wrestling with them, they start to get easier and easier and you're just maybe taking dictation at a certain point at the best moment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can imagine him giggling to himself writing marvelous like that, you know, just like <laughs> the perfect, the perfect spelling of that word for crazy. <laughs> and weedy, weedy, weedy. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, certainly he knew Latin. Uh, you know, part of his Catholic uh, schoolboy training. Yeah. Um, yeah, jo Joyce, uh, his, his obituary in Time Magazine uh, uh, compares him to Joyce, but I never found any um, any direct connection, and I looked. I looked. Uh, there's a reference to Harriman and, and Vladimir Nabokov. There's a... Uh, you know, T.S. Eliot, we know, was a fan. Uh, e. e. Cummings, of course, was probably the most influential fan, you know, mm -hmm. of I mean, without E.E. E. Cummings, we don't know, you know, how Charles Schultz would have seen, would have seen Crazy Cat. Uh, that was that, that was the book that came out when Charles Schultz, uh, you know, came back from the military and came across this. So, um, but, um, but don't know about, uh, about Joyce. So with all the exhaustive research you guys have done on Harriman, have we ever figured out how Ignatz could get his his head through the bars of the jail, but not escape? <laughs> you would think it would be fairly easy after that. I think we need the cartoonist to explain that to us. <laughs> Poetic license. <laughs> Actually, I see this this question in the comments about was there a reason he spelled things out phonetically, and that's interesting because I, I I realized that you can make characters speak with a standard diction or you can choose to make it harder for the reader. Um, but you're, you're kind of bringing them into a world where the language is not going to be, um, I don't know, standard market language in a way it's going to have its own sort of twist to it. Right. Well, I mean, he came from two places that were real, real polyglot cities, New Orleans in the eight, in the 19th century. And then, turn of the century in New York City, um, you know, the, the, the mixture, the cocktail of languages he heard was so, uh, so astounding. Right, uh, Brian Nelson, right, Pete Hamill and Leroy Jones 
uh, both love Crazy Cat as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, this is one that I, I, this is a slide that I had submitted. This was, um, I think I've mentioned this to you guys before, but there's a series. So this, this guy in England, I don't remember how I got, how we got in touch. It was like, it was a little over 10 years ago. We, I might've been over Facebook or something like that. Um, this guy, he, he had been moving out of an apartment as the same time someone else was. And the other person moving out just left this behind on the street. <laughs> and so he, you know, did the thing of walked away and then decided to come back and, oh, okay, I'll pick it up. And then he just had it. He didn't really know. He knew that there was a George Harriman and a crazy cat and it was probably had some value to it. But he didn't really know much about it. So somehow this ended up in England. Wow. And uh, I, I didn't even really need to do any research into this to find out that it's, there is a, another, there was one other colored, hand colored Sunday from this sequence. It's a sequence of five or six strips in which they're complaining about taxes. Yeah. And now up to 10 years later, I think maybe four of them have shown up hand colored and inscribed to different people. And so somebody brought this to England in the original frame. Yeah, that is the original frame, I'm going to guess, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. If I remember, I think the cartoons Jack Kent got, has one of these, had one. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Jack Kent had one of these, yeah. And it, it, it's a really strange, it's, it's weird that he did a continued story in Sunday pages. I don't think he's done that too often, or maybe this is the only time he did it. Well, yeah. the last two, the last two Sundays. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. often, though. But also if, oh, and then also there's, wasn't there one where? The seance strip was, uh, there, were, there was a, 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 a series, a, a, two, a two Sunday strip series uh, concerning a seance. I feel like there was something involving No Man's Land in, in 1917, 1918, something, I'm wrong about that, but. This oh, one not only was well, like, which bodies was I think three episodes. Okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, this is also one of those. I mean, these two panels with with uh, Ignatz and Pop and the changing landscape. Even the road changes a little bit. It's straight and it it curves. But the um, that that formation in the in the logo panel. It's almost like a like a Henry Moore sculpture. You know that that cactus yeah. is leaning against. They're just. Um, the forms that he uses and the inventions that he used um, just to sort of change scenes and you don't, you don't think about it. It just seems really normal mm -hmm. for this world. Yeah. You know, uh, one thing I was thinking, Glenn, about your piece from World War II is a reminder. This is, uh, this is, Her this is Herman's birthday, by the way, August, uh, August 22nd, right? Wow. Well, it looks like, looks like this, this trip is dated on Herman's birthday. Uh, Oh, huh. good eye, Michael. <laughs> but uh, the fact that Crazy Cat, we have Crazy Cat through World War One and World War Two, and and they're very different experiences. Uh, World War One was largely fought in Crazy Cat uh, in the daily pages, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's a lot of pleas for pacifism uh, and for peace, which was kind of in keeping with William Hurst's position as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Later on. The cartoonists are kind of put to work when when Hearst one, one time where you could we could see that that Harriman was kind of uh, given some marching orders uh, when Hearst's patriotism was being challenged uh, hmm. over his position on World War One. The cartoonists suddenly start doing strips about the importance of buying war bonds and things like that. Um, but there's some really one. There's a wonderful. There, there's one one of my there's about four or five daily strips I go back and and one is. Uh, Ignatz and Crazy Cat are marching uh, uh, out on the uh, out on out on you know on the, on the battlefield, and uh, one calls out to the other, "Friend or foe?" I think he says "Friend or four, something like that, and says "Friend." And they see each other, and the last panel they say "Dollink," and they're hugging. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's it's pure love. It's, that, that, he, he, did, he did have one Sunday page, I think around nineteen eighteen, with the Kaiser in it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then in World War II, they they get they get to work, you know they're working for the draft board or, or you know they or you know, uh, Ignatz is flying you know in the Air Force like in that in that daily strip. And there was a single panel illustration he did for some magazine of them all throwing bricks at the Axis guys with them yeah. running away. Yeah. yeah. 
Michael, you mentioned Hearst, um, and, and we know about Hearst's support um, for Harriman's work. Do we know what sort of relationship Harriman had with Arthur Brisbane? Um, that's a really good question. No, no, I don't have anything, anything direct with, with Brisbane. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot more um, about Tad Dorgan and Arthur Brisbane. Right. <laughs> Tad. Or old, old Double Dome. I, Double Dome, I believe, was his nickname. Yeah, right. So my, my sense is, you know, Harriman, and Harriman talks about Brisbane in some of those interviews uh, that I uncovered that are up at uh, Syracuse. But um, it's kind of playing along. I think he just enjoyed the jokes with Arthur Brisbane. Um, you know, more than anything else. And he's kind of like reciting the different, the different, and in them, Harriman seems to be off to the side laughing at the jokes, but not really the instigator uh, of that stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a comment that somebody is asking, Sarah Boxer is asking about the connection between Gustin and, and Harriman. I mean, I, I see that really clearly one of the, one of the tear sheets that we saw, the color tear sheets where, you know, Pup is on the ground and you see his head in profile. I, I look at that and I see, I see Augustine figure. I see Augustine self-portrait or Augustine head. Um, I, I don't know a specific connection, but some of the language seems to be the same, the visual language. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah asked if there are some strips with Ignatz and Hood. So I think referring to Ku Klux Klan references, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember if Ignaz is in the hood, but there are strips with clans people. There's actually a, um, in the family upstairs, the strip that Crazy Cat came out of, uh, about this mysterious family upstairs, and, and Mr. Dingbat is, is always trying to find out who they are. Uh, at one time, he does go up there and see uh, a circle of clansmen uh, in hoods. And there were a couple other moments like that in Crazy Cat, too. I don't remember if it was Ignaz in the hood or not. I, mm -hmm. I kind of don't think it was, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah. But there, are, there are references, there are some overt references to, to the clan in, uh, in Crazy Cat. Well, Gustin, uh, Gustin would have been in LA at the same time as Harriman, wouldn't he? 20s yeah. and 30s? I don't know Gustin's, I don't know Gustin's life that well. I don't know much uh, about well, he, he, grew, he grew up, I mean, I think born in Canada, but I believe he, he grew up in LA. I think I sent it to you, Rob, but I there's I have a Franz Klein book that uh, he did at Ignatz Painting. Oh, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Huh. And we had a quote from Elaine de Kooning that William de Kooning was a fan. Hmm. But we, you know, we never firmed up Picasso, though, did we? Well, we, we kind of did. Um, so uh, uh, Eric Reynolds of Fanographics uh, located a uh, discussion with Seldis, where Seldis said he showed Picasso a Crazy Cat. So I don't think Picasso was early on enamored with Crazy Cat. Uh, and that early early reference uh, of, of Picasso looking at comics pages when he's over in France, um, brought by, uh, I guess, by Gertrude Stein, mm -hmm. uh, specifically mentioned that he asked for the Cast and Jammer kids. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, the Seldis, uh, Eric just found in the last year this reference uh, of showing Crazy Cat to Picasso and Picasso admiring it. Hmm. But it's not as if, it didn't seem as if it was a big, you know, lifelong uh, influence. You know, one of the things that's really funny is when I, I notice when people, when people have uh, artists that they're interviewing, they always start asking about other artists. Um, you know, like I feel like if people would interview Chaplin, they'd say, so what do you think about Buster Keaton? It's like, you're talking to Chaplin, you don't need to ask him. <laughs> I feel that way right now because, because in my opinion, and I don't mean to put anybody in the spot right now, but the person who brings Harriman forward most profoundly is Patrick McDonald, uh, okay. at least in daily comics. Um, and there are overt references in many of the strips, of course, uh, as well as sly references with acorns instead of bricks being thrown. Um, but Picture, Pictures hanging on walls. <laughs> but um and but and certainly visually um and i'm wondering patrick uh i don't know if i ever asked you this but uh as you were developing mutts of course you knew harriman at that point and written about harriman and studied harriman did you think or did it just kind of come out without thinking that that you were going to find a line that's expressive and in some ways sort of similar to the way that Harriman's line is expressive. You know, um, 
you don't think about any of that stuff. I, I think when I discovered Herman, like I said, when I was 13, and after Herman, even just, you know, I was lucky in the, that was the late sixties, early seventies. That's when they started reprinting all the old comic strips. You know, that you, all of a sudden there was a whole, you know, and you could discover Barney Google and Seagar's Popeye. And just intuitively, I just fell in love with that stuff because it was compared, you know, the comics growing up in the 60s, you know, started being a little more uh, mechanical looking. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing against those cartoonists, but, um, you know, that scratchy homemade feel just appealed to me so much. And that's kind of the way I liked to draw. So uh, I just felt, that, you know, a kinship with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That just scratchy old style just appealed to me. And just... well, I, th I think it's also, I th you know, you and I have talked a little bit about the process that you see in Harriman's work from the scratch marks to, you know, very brief sort of pencil marks. And I know having seen, you know, a little bit of your, your sketch work, you know, that the process is also important to you. And I think, you know, that's something that, that draws us to Harriman's work. Uh, we've had some discussion about, you know, how planned out, say, is a Sunday page or how intuitive is it? And I think it's that line that gets walked that's one of the things um, that we're attracted to in his work. Yeah, that, that, that playfulness that you could actually, you know, just magically appears on the page. That's the, that's the fun of cartooning, like just things appear magically in front of you. And with the labor, the, all the labor hidden. Yeah, yep. I think also... So one one similarity I see in Mutz and, and, and Crazy Cat is that, that both strips are not afraid to be uh, emotionally direct, uh, to be you know to be very frank. Um, you know the uh, like, like that strip I mentioned of Crazy Cat and Ignat saying who's their friend or foe, friend or foe, uh, friend, and then hugging each other at the end. That that's sort of a Mutz like Crazy Cat to me. Uh, you know, like like it's not seeking a gag. You know, it's not necessarily you know trying to. You know, uh, there's no rim shot there. Um, it's it's a, it's pretty raw emotion in uh, in four panels in the daily strip, and I, I feel that way. Uh, you know, I think you did a recent one, uh, Patrick, with uh, a quote from Aristotle, something about um, you can you can, you got to be cold if you're going to look out and, and enjoy the snow. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally not agreeing what, what you what you wrote there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, what was that exactly? Oh, you, 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 I'm not going to be able to remember the quote. <laughs> You probably drew it uh, six weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but basically, you can't you can't really appreciate the snow without standing on the cold. Without, without being in the cold. Yeah. Right, right, right. That also struck me as a very Herman-esque moment. That you um, that, that's the other beauty of Herman that uh, he any subject you know it, it, he, you know he wasn't just going for gags. It was like whatever he wanted to write about, he wrote about. I mean, he gave cartoonist the permission to uh, explore anything. I, I particularly like the spirituality in his work, you know. Um, you know. That resonated with me. I think that's what resonated with Charles Schultz. I think he gave Charles Schultz permission to touch subjects that other cartoonists weren't touching, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big, a big influence, I think, on everybody. He opened up the possibilities of what you could do in this medium. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I'm flattered that you see me in, you know, seeing my him in my work. But boy, I, when I look at his things, I don't even feel like we're in the same profession. Well, we mentioned Jack Kent briefly before too, and um, you know, Jack Kent I think had a similar playfulness in King Aru, both mm -hmm. in the drawing and the the, the language use. Uh, but I think in Kent's children's books as well, I think he carried that. You know, into that medium, he maintained that sort of playfulness. Yeah, and they, you know, they corresponded quite a bit. I think Patrick, you have those letters. Uh, yeah, Jack, Jack Kent was a, a big fan, and they they talked back and forth. And like I, I think, you know, he has that at least that one hand colored page from her. Yeah, and I think I think Jack Kent visited Harriman, and I think he wrote about the fact that he was shocked he could look up George Harriman in the phone book. Yep, <laughs> and show up at his and show up at his house, and they spent some time together, which was an unusual personal connection for Harriman in the last years of his life. Yeah, I, I uh, bumped up the contrast on this one just to kind of see if we could see any of the pencils a little bit better. So it's not great, but I kind of cropped it differently too. So I was thinking about the uh, 
like you said, the, the layout work you might have done ahead of actually doing the inking. What kind of pendant is that, Patrick? Is that a crow crow? <laughs> I, w I wish I knew. <laughs> Do we know which strip that is? It looks like a Sunday. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm sure we can figure that out. It looks familiar to me. It's an early, yeah, I think it's an early 20s. Is it like 22 or something? It, it's funny that he's inking the middle panel first. Huh. I wonder what the thought behind that was. Huh. Oh, and, and actually, maybe it was for the photograph because it's, it looks like it's the classic image of getting beamed by the bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. Interesting. Well, that issue of Judge, if that's the issue that has the self portrait in it, wasn't that 1922? Right. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, good detective work there. Mm -hmm. When did the doll come out? That I don't know. Uh, that doll was out in the late teens uh, and stayed out for a while. Huh. Uh, there's also a picture of Dee Cox holding that doll. Uh, mm. you, know that, you know that picture of the family in the car? Right. Uh, it's one of the few pictures of, of the two daughters and Herman and his wife. And, uh, and Dee is holding the, uh, the crazy cat doll. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. We talked about one thing I wanted to mention, um, because he just passed away over the last few months. Uh, we talked about the Masters of American Comic Show and, and uh, you know what that meant to us. But uh, in the catalog, uh, Stanley Crouch did a wonderful essay, Blues for Crazy Cat. Um, that, uh, and in it, he talks about um, talking to Ralph Ellison about Crazy Cat. And yeah. when that birth certificate was first found, which I did not, that was found in the, in the early 1970s. Um, which was the first indication that Crazy Cat was, I mean, that Harriman was not a, uh, a son of Greek immigrants, but was uh, a black man uh, or mixed race. And, uh, and Crouch said he talked to Ellison about that and Ellison was surprised. Mm -hmm. And so Crouch said, paraphrasing him, but that sort of told him that even in these whispering moments, uh, you know, that the black intelligentsia did not have that awareness of, of the Harriman was, was racially passive. Mm -hmm. That you know, was a successful pass. And that kind of, if anybody would have known about it, Ralph Ellison would have, you know, would have known about it and talked about it. If he was, you know, very uh, tuned into popular culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually, I, I wanted to read a uh, sentence that Stanley Crouch wrote, just because we did lose Stanley just uh, recently. And it's just a lovely line. I actually quoted in my book um, that uh, the writer Stanley Crouch suggested that Harriman understood that, however he might feel in private. This is a quote of, of Stanley's here. It was the job of any good clown to make the audience laugh, not by forgetting, but by remembering just how frail and absurd are the tunings of existence. Mm -hmm. That's a great not, not by forgetting how absurd things are, but by remembering how absurd they are. The mm -hmm. are. I thought that was a, a lovely description of what happens up there. Yeah. Yeah, that, that definitely sums up a lot of the appeal of the strip right there. It's, uh, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. So somebody in the comments is telling us that the strip is from 1924, July 29th. Great. Yeah, we'll look that up after Thank afterward. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paducci. <laughs> That's good. I, I, I like it when we talk to obsessive people. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are my people. Who are you talking about, Glenn? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, Craig also asked the question: uh, How did Harriman fit into the public eye during his, you know, during his day? Was he a celebrity or not well known? Um, he wasn't a celebrity like some cartoonists were, but but he was for a period of time. Um, he uh, he did advertisements for a for an auto dealership in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, you know, so he was listed among the celebrities, uh, you know, that that bought their cars at that dealership. Uh, you know, he was he was a pretty uh, self-effacing guy. Uh, in fact, the only criticisms I ever see from his friends and colleagues about Harriman is how damn modest he is. Uh, <laughs> you know, and even, even referred him as having an inferiority complex uh, in, in one uh, in one article about him. They said one one guy I forgot who who, uh, who said it, but one cartoonist said that he has an inferiority complex that he could fit all Ignatz Ignatz and bricks into. Is that the Tad Dorgan cartoon about Harriman? Which one? The Tad Dorgan cartoon where they refer to him as the Greek, where you just right. see Harriman's back. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. They did for a, a, a trade magazine uh, for circulation. For right. circulation, yes, yep. Yeah, and then actually what, another like really startling daily strip with really direct racial content is uh, playing off of that idea of an authority complex is uh, Crazy Cat's looking at a mirror and says, why didn't you tell me, Ignatz? And Ignatz says, what? And Crazy says, I have an inferiority complexion. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, really a, a kind of a raw strip. Mm -hmm. um, for celebrity, um, yeah, I mean, when, when the, uh, when the, I think the animations, uh, although they weren't really, you know, except for the very, very first ones, weren't really based on Crazy Cat, I think that brought his name out. Uh, in, a, in a pretty significant way. Uh, then when the uh, when the Crazy Cat Ballet was at Town Hall in 1922, um, there was lots of media about that. Um, but I think he was more, uh, he was more kind of a writer's writer, a cartoonist, cartoonist, you know, that, that kind of thing. He was referred to uh, you know, in those terms, not as a, uh, not necessarily as a major celebrity, but as uh, a sort of cult. Uh, sort of called celebrity even uh, even at that time. Bill, Bill, I've got a question for you. Sure. Having heard us talk about George Harriman and Crazy Cat now, <laughs> is, is it? Are, do you do? Does is is uh, is enlightenment upon you? Are you going to be bidding against everybody on Crazy? Cat? <laughs> well, I can't say I'll be bidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm still putting a few kids through college uh, and have a few more to go, but. Um, uh, no, but you know, the thing is I'm going to read a lot more. I mean, i will honest, when I looked at his work before, I almost couldn't read it. You know, I did. And, and, and it partially was, I think, because I just didn't take the time to really understand, uh, why, you know, what I didn't, what I didn't get about reading the story, the, the strip. I, but what I, what I really want to do is what you, what you guys have suggested is go back and read them aloud. And and I think that it, it will make much more sense. I mean, I really appreciate the idea that uh, you know this, how you read it read it in front of your son, your, your child, and it and it made so much uh, it, it was so enjoyable to them. And just the act of reading it, you know, it's back to that language thing. I, when I was re when I read through the strips originally, it, you know, it's hard for me to piece together uh, what I was reading and what the characters were doing in the in the panel. But I think I can get it now. Whereas I've never taken, I hadn't taken the time before to ever really understand it. So I'm, that's what I, that's what part I'm excited about is just going back and uh, I don't have Patrick's book and I, and I I did just order Michael's book earlier today, uh, not signed Michael, but uh, I, I'm going to put that link out there uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, I should mention there's a bookstore in New Orleans. Uh, we we're all supporting our indie bookstores during these times, um, and there's a, a store Octavia Books, octaviabooks.com. And uh, if anybody wants me to personalize it, uh, I, I go over there for any excuse to, uh, to sign any books. So uh, they, they, they keep signed copies on hand, but I'm also happy to go over there and personalize anything. So I would encourage anybody to, to buy from, if, if not their local independent bookstore, uh, Octavia is a great, a great place. There are other places I know to purchase these things. But, uh, and sometimes they can be a few dollars cheaper, but uh, if you can find it in yourself, uh, I do recommend the indie places. Uh, George Herman would shop at indie places. Yes, he would shop, shop like George would shop. <laughs> uh, here, is a, here is a correction on that one piece uh, from Peducci. Oh, 23. Okay. We'll check that out. Uh, the question right. about celebrity, I should also mention that by, um, by the mid-20s, uh, anytime a newspaper would have a poll of its readers, on what your favorite comic strip was, Crazy Cat was always on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, you started up and then I, you went. Down. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. I was thinking you were going to say it was up the yeah. top. No, and 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 they dropped the strip. Uh, that is a myth that Her that Hearst wouldn't let his newspapers drop the strip because they dropped the strip, and often they drop the strip because um, you know because of a uh, of reader complaints uh, about how kind of confusing it was. They didn't want to take the time uh, to to. Uh, to spend with uh, with Crazy Cat, um, and there's a couple of stories. Actually, there was a newspaper in Iowa where I think it was a publishing magazine kind of played out the, uh, the 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 story over a couple issues. But the advertising section of the newspaper wanted to drop Crazy Cat, and the editorial section of the paper insisted it stay in. Mm -hmm. They all had the, the, the comics, so it was a great uh, <laughs> a, a great newspaper battle between advertising and editorial there. 
I think I think I think it kept in. I think it stayed in. Well, that's 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 a good win for him. <laughs> well, uh, sorry, I was just looking through to see if there were any other comments that popped in while we were talking, but. Uh, this has been a great guys. I honestly, I, you know, we should do this again and, and pick a different uh, creator to talk about too. This is, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. This is, like I said before, uh, this is really our first kind of dive into just speaking about a, a single creator and, and the chats that we've done, but I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You, you know, this was more than the first. That's interesting. That's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before, uh, before we got started, I was talking with Michael about it. We've been doing these for about eight months now, but I've, I focused initially mostly on other collectors and trying to get the stories out there. And really what, what got, what prompted me to start doing these at all was uh, I, I actually had scheduled a conversation with Russ Cochran and I wanted to have a, I wanted to kind of get his story down. And we had, we had talked in February or, or maybe it was late January last year. And, uh, and then of course he passed, I believe at the beginning of March. And, and that was what really kind of prompted me to start doing conversations, uh, you know, during COVID and whatnot. Was just just because I was worried that we were going to lose stories of, of of people who are knowledgeable about other people or or people who might not be here, and, and including not just the artists, because I started with the collectors and the the people who kind of founded the comic art, at least uh, collecting community from older dealers and that sort of thing is what I, where I started, or collectors who've been around for a long time. Uh, but when we kind of us. <laughs> exactly exactly and so uh but we were talking in december and that was when we said we need to make a conscious decision to kind of do specialized shows and talk more about creators and and bring in more people who aren't just you know i mean we're all we all love the arts and the, and the artwork but at the same time just you know bringing people who are who are more knowledgeable than us on certain topics and 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 discuss titles and artists and and that's really where we're, we're going with 2021 and and you know i i think during uh during COVID, it, it, this is more important than ever for us to kind of get together and talk about it and share share our, share the the knowledge that each of us has about the hobby and the and the things that we all love so that's that's really the, you know kind of the mission that we're going to be putting ourselves on for the rest of the year it's also incredible for me to see how herman's popularity has grown so many years after his passing we live in a really a golden age of comic strip reprints and comic book reprints and you see like the fantagraphic volumes of all the complete sunday pages and those weren't available you know 20 years ago mm -hmm. and just finding harem and tear sheets was was really quite scarce so to see his popularity grow and to see more people become you know so they're so much yeah. more interested in his work than before is really quite wonderful when yeah, I, they're, uh, they're putting out sundays on uh and larger scale than, than the previous books too. So uh, <laughs> good. Yeah, I got the Tashin book of uh, Sundays, which is also that's that's a good one. Actually, uh, the Sunday Press one is a really lovely one too. Uh, Peter Mareska's uh, uh, book, which I think is out of print now. I think it's sold out, but uh, that's a great one. Fine, also very yeah. very uses the coffee table. There's a, a dealer whose name I won't mention, but uh, fairly early on in collecting in the hobby, he 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 has. Healthy prices, like many dealers do. So he, whenever he had a crazy cat, he always sold it for like relatively normal, like a normal amount, and they would they would fly out. And I asked him about that. He said, "I don't get it. But I, <laughs> I don't know why people buy these things." And then one day at one of the shows, he 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 had this really nice one for sale. I said, "About that?" He said, "No, no, that's not for sale. I I bought that one." And he'd gone, he paid a massive amount of money for it. Funny. I said, why'd you pay that much? He said, I, I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> All context. I mean, I think about the days and uh, I mean, Patrick, you're really familiar with the Graham Gallery. I mean, when they were selling Sunday pages back in the 80s, maybe even earlier than that, um, it, it's incredible to think of how values have gone up, monetary values, mm -hmm. um, not just um, his appreciation. The first one I bought at the Grand Gallery was nine hundred dollars. Oh. Now uh, I'm doing a lot about you know the history of art sales too. So where where was the Graham Gallery or Madison Avenue? Were not they in New York? Yeah, the okay. Graham Gallery was Madison Avenue. I think like Eighty Second Street, maybe. Okay. And um, it, it, you should know about them. They were like a they were. You know, a very old, well-established fine art gallery, and they were the Mr. Graham was the first guy to actually show comic art as real art. 
Mm -hmm. he, he had a Crazy Cat show. He had a Windsor McKay show. Uh, he also showed Edward Gorey's work. Mm -hmm. But this was before this was before anybody considered comic art fine art. Mm -hmm. He was way ahead of the, and that's how I ended up doing the Crazy Cat book. They they actually had a Crazy Cat show, and I was talking to a, a woman who worked there, Georgia Riley. Did yeah, have it on, and. Um, a lot of the Hermans didn't have copyrights on them, so she didn't have the dates for them, and I just happened to have a lot of tear sheets. Mm -hmm. So uh, I told her I could help her with some of the dates. And then, uh, boy, just in passing, my wife and I said it'd be nice if someone did a book someday on them. <laughs> she, she called me up the next week and said, Mr. Graham wants to do that crazy cat book with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, think, I think I was 23 at the time. Yeah. <laughs> For people who don't have crazy cats hanging in their living room, we did have a question I saw from Mike. I don't know how to pronounce Mike's name, Saichi or Sichi. Uh, is there a large collection of original crazy cat art exhibited or stored in one location? Uh, shows when are they out of town and <laughs> <laughs> right. No, yeah. I mean that that's that's an excellent question. I don't know if there is there is there somebody who's sitting on an archive? Well the Billy Ireland uh, Museum uh, at in Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, has uh, has a, a wonderful collection of of everything cartoon related, and has some wonderful Herman works. And they do rotating shows and bring bring those out at different times. So that's one place. And they've does got Sir, does Syracuse University have originals by him? No, no, they had um, they have what what they had what if they do they might I mean if they do there's a couple of colleges that have maybe one here or one there. Um, you know, what they have was, in, was a, the, the files uh, done by a guy who was uh, going to do a book on Arthur Brisbane, uh, her right hand man, and he went around and talked to all the cartoonists. So they've got double space typed uh, transcript, transcriptions of interviews with Airmen and Seagar and, you know, and, all, and Tad Dorgan's widow, um, who said, uh, by the way, that. Um, Tad Dorgan had a diary that she made sure was destroyed because it had material that she didn't want the public to know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I mean, I, I know certain people that certain families that have, uh, you know, the, his, his, the, the grandson of Harriman's friends in Arizona is, a, is doing a wonderful job archiving his family's uh, material. Mm -hmm. So all the letters that Harriman sent to, uh, you know, to them, uh, is collected all that Arizona content is collected the uh, the little program um, on his uh, birthday in 1922 that Dorothea Lang and uh, Jimmy Swinton uh, were, were, were part of uh, you know all that all that stuff's there but I guess Billy Ireland probably more than any other place that I can think of where if people go to Monument Valley you could visit Goulding's Lodge and look at the the guest book there you know of, of yeah Ireland. Right, they don't have. They have a. They have a little uh, guest. They have a little museum at at, at Goulding's Lodge, and it has a Swinnerton, has the original Swinnerton up on the wall. But didn't Harriman adorn um, some uh, guest book entries? Yeah, yes. but that was, that was not at Goulding. So Swinnerton would stay at Goulding's Lodge, and Harriman would stay with the Wetherills. Gotcha. And the Wetherill and the Wether then those those books, uh, except for the very first one, which was stolen, uh, they think possibly because Teddy Roosevelt's signature was in there also. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but those law those those books uh, still exist, um, mm -hmm. and he would draw a little when he was visiting with his friends the roaches. He would draw little roaches, and uh, do these wonderful illustrations in the in the guest book. So that's mm -hmm. that's there. Um, there was a big exhibit uh, uh, in Spain, right? Did anybody go to that? The, yeah, I wish I wish I did. The one Brian Walker did. did in Spain. Walker. Yeah, uh, it looked look like it was, but there's video if you go to YouTube. I think it's, what's the name of the museum? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. Reina Sophia. Y'all can laugh at me or put in the comments the name of the museum. <laughs> but um, but it looked like it was a fantastic exhibit. They 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 drew from a lot, and uh, it was it was all harem and, and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see video uh, uh, walking around that museum uh, uh, on YouTube. Yeah, the Graham Gallery used to have quite a few, <laughs> and they would they would do shows. And I have to tell you, the most ex one of the most exciting days of my life when we did do the book, um, you know, we got to fly to Arizona and meet his granddaughter Dee, and uh, you know, Dee was the person who saved all his his originals, mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, we got to go to a bank and open up a bank box. And I don't, I think back then she probably had 100, 200 original <laughs> to sit in a room and be with those were just uh, probably the most, one of the most exciting days of my life. Wow. Yes. Our, our, our book was shot like 90% from those originals. Sure. Yeah. yeah. She, so she, she put her kids through college, uh, you know, selling. Yeah. Um, I, I, the last time I was with, with Dee, um, I should mention too that the Crazy was optioned for, for a documentary by the filmmaker Jonathan Hawk, who's a wonderful filmmaker, done a lot of sports related uh, documentaries in the past. And uh, before the shutdown, uh, I said, you know, we should, we should go to Arizona and talk to Dee before we do anything else. You know, even if you don't have funding for the whole thing, let's just go spend some time with Dee. Uh, because she was hale and hearty and healthy and in her 80s, and let's not wait around. Um, so I had a wonderful day with her. He conducted some wonderful, she's on film talking about her grandfather. Uh, and it's really wonderful. So we had to kind of stop the, we had to kind of stop the uh, production of the film because of COVID and cancel some scheduled interviews. But as soon as we get back up again, uh, it'll, it'll be there. That's wonderful. Cool. Reina Sofia Mitia Nacional Centro de Arte. Thank you, Kaduchi. Nice. I didn't spell it right. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Now I know how to spell it. All right. Well, I think we should keep on talking until uh, the last viewer drops away. <laughs> <laughs> or I pass out. <laughs> right. If the, you know, in, in, uh, Hollywood, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, uh, you know, the, the keto diet and paleo. So I have to eat before eight o'clock or I turn into a pumpkin. So <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. Well, I, I've been home alone for a week now. And so I've been eating, I haven't had dinner yet either. That's it's, and it's yeah. 10 o'clock here, but yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. But, but definitely guys, I think that, you know, and this is, uh, this is exactly what I, I hoped it would be. I mean, you guys have been fantastic. And, yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. It really yeah, was. Fun. It's nice that your first one was George Herman. That's a nice way to start. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. So no, those there'll be plenty more of these. And uh, if any, of, next. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, hey, I, I am very much open to suggestions. I mean, anybody, you know, I'd like to use the platform to to you know, I don't want to come up with all the ideas. And Michael, if I if I we hadn't been chatting and and you helped me do that Jake Hitman interview, uh, we might not have ever done this, right? You know, it's just that. We, we, I kind of went from referral to referral, and then and and you able were able to help me out. So, uh, so yeah, you know, you never know where, where these stories are going to come from. But um, any yeah. ideas that anybody wants to throw at me, I'm I'm really happy to tackle uh, any creator. So, again, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And uh, if uh, I don't, so just making sure we don't have any. Uh, nope. See, so everybody said they had a lot of fun hanging out with us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like you all um, when the whole when the whole thing uh, in the after times. Uh, this is going out to well, Patrick's already done it, but you, Glenn, and you, Rob, and you, Bill, and anybody watching. Um, I did create a little uh, George Harriman walking tour, which you can do online. Uh, it's on my it's on my website, michaeltestron oh, cool. But when you go to New Orleans, please uh, please contact me through my website, and we'll go. I, on. I will take you up to that. Please, yeah, that's great. It's, a, it's amazing that almost everything he did is still there. Yeah. yeah. His house isn't still there, but his church is still there and, and uh, the, the tailor shop. And you get a real sense of the place, uh, of the Tremaine neighborhood where he grew up. So, um, so you all come to New Orleans. We'll be there next week. Come back. Bill, All right. thanks very much for organizing this. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you.